All right, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, that's something that I started to work on uh, um, in the last few months. And it's really a series of lessons that I learn while trying to make my website talk in different ways and using different approaches. And uh, so today, I hope that I will be able to transfer uh, my lesson learned. Of course, uh, feel free to interact as much as possible. This is really an open session. So um, I have learned things by doing uh, experiments. I'm sure that um, in the audience we have also uh, other experience worth sharing. So I'm here for that. Uh, that's, that's usually how we get the best out of these workshops. Um, I help publisher uh, create a sustainable organic growth uh, using semantic web technologies. And uh, this is a little bit of uh, the typical lift that um, the technology that we created um, brings into a website. So you can see here um, the results of the organic traffic compared to 160 other websites uh, that deal with the travel industry in Austria. So you can see that we started way below, a little bit below the average, and then after three months, you know, we started to see the lift of, you know, creating data that computers can use for creating new services. I also love, and that's probably one of the reasons I'm here, I love to experiment in new ways to interact with web content. Um, and, uh, and I started to use artificial intelligence uh, uh, in the last uh, five years of my experience um, on the web. These are some of the metrics when I started to work on uh, semantic web technologies uh, back in uh, 2008, 2009. It was still very hard to justify the results the return of the investment of you know, creating the infrastructure for publishing data. Um, and now in, in 2018, finally, you know, we have enough data, enough metrics that we can prove that more metadata, more content structured, helps search engine, smart agent, personal assistant, and why not chatbot provide more traffic to your site. So these are some of the metrics that I was able to measure on a design blog from Poland. And this is a research that I published last year and presented in a, in a conference in Amsterdam. Um, my name is Andrea Volpini, as I was introduced. Um, I am the CEO of a company called Wordlift that uh, uses AI to automate structured data markup. Uh, I've been doing uh, web uh, and working as an entrepreneur on the web for the last 20 years. So I've been around for quite a long time. And that's, you can ask these to Google and Google will respond. Um, and actually you can also ask to Bing something more personal like my mom and dad. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's also, you know, I've been experimenting with knowledge graph across, you know, these many years uh, of uh, work in the semantic web world. And so there is a lot of things that have changed uh, in this last few years. And that's, uh, it's really the ground basis of what we're gonna talk about today. So mainly the workshop is divided in three sections. Uh, so the first section is a little bit of uh, introduction on linguistic AI. So there's a lot of talk about artificial intelligence these days. I am focused on what is called linguistic AI, which is uh, you know, the area of the technology that uh, covers the structuring of content and the organization of knowledge. And um, smart content structured data are you know, basically the buyout products of these activities, of this development in, in the AI world. I'm particularly focused for uh, publishers, so bloggers and news and media editors, but of course we are also starting to work with shop owners. Uh, but this presentation is more for you know, people that have editorial content 
and uh, want to create you know, new ways of interaction with this content. Then the second section is about, uh, I call it conversational design 101. Um, I learned it the hard way by making experiments. There is a lot of literature uh, these days uh, which is very valuable for uh, uh, conversational design. I'm just going to go through uh, the main mistakes that we made with these experiments and, uh, and then also uh, we're going to talk a little bit about voice search, uh, which is the way that uh, these technology are becoming more and more common um, among our users because of course, uh, yes, there are 500 million uh, um, Google Assistant powered devices in, in the world today. But most of the traffic that we see is coming from, you know, web users using, you know, their voice for making queries to the search engine. That's really, you know, what voice search is. I'm going to introduce a little bit the metrics that we can measure when we create a conversational interface and when we start seeing, you know, traffic coming from voice devices into our website. And then I'm going to show you uh, a little bit uh, of uh, the, the back end of a Google Action. Google Action is a, an application that you can create for providing uh, um, interaction through the Google Assistant. So, and then, and then we're just going to wrap it up. Yes, you can ask me as many questions as you want. You just raise your hands. I mean, we're going to leave it uh, as freestyle as possible. Uh, and of course, if something is not clear, you also please stop me and ask. Um, you can go to this website, uh, um, use the code uh, uh, 174709. I have prepared uh, uh, just a few introductory questions just to know each other a little bit. Um, I wish we could uh, give the space to everyone to present and introduce himself or herself, uh, but that's, that's like uh, <laughs> the way we're going to do it. So uh, if you go there and, uh, and, and, and you provide the answers, then uh, we can start uh, looking at it. And that's, uh, so we can come back there. Um, all right, so you're ready rolling. <laughs> So uh, let me get this into the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's interesting. It let let me understand a little bit more about your background. <laughs> and uh, okay, content editor and publisher, digital agency, of course, developers. That's what we expect, of course, at the WordCamp Europe. Uh, web designers, uh, entrepreneurs, startuppers, anything else. All right, all right. Yeah, content editors on the rise. <laughs> Developers are the biggest community, of course. Wow, wow. <laughs> that's good, that's good. All right, um, as, as people continue with these, uh, I will also have put another simple question which is a little bit of the background that you have so that I can understand more uh, how deep I can get. And uh, search engine optimization is a big topic. It's actually uh, what I realized back in uh, 2011 when the search engine decided to agree on a standard called schema.org to design and, you know, a system for describing content. And so after many years in the semantic web, I was working uh, on my own CMS. Um, at that time, I wasn't um, at all involved in the WordPress community. I'm fairly new in this community. Uh, we, we had our own as a, I had uh, my own agency and we had our own uh, CMS like many agencies do. Uh, especially, I mean, uh, back in the, in the days, you're talking about 2006, 2007. And, uh, and then we started to look at uh, ways of organizing this content because we were managing the, the website for the Italian parliament. So we had a lot of web pages, we had a lot of laws, and we had a lot of millions of users coming every day to this website and we needed to organize the content properly. So I started to investigate more on semantic uh, technologies. 
back in 2008, 2009, uh, even a little bit b before than that. But then it all um, turned into SEO for me when you know this technology became uh, more and more uh, uh, connected with the way that search engine interprets the, the human language. All right, so yes, I think uh, we have a terrific audience uh, with uh, you know all the knowledge that uh, that uh, that we need to move forward. And probably there is a lot of things that I can learn from you. So I hope that uh, we can get this rolling. Um, and uh, and we can get back here. All right, so. One very basic language is that um, any AI system needs reliable data. You know, whatever type of uh, machine learning uh, approach you're using, whatever type of neural networks you're trying to configure, you are going to need data and you're going to need a lot of data. And when this data becomes semantically structured, it gets way easier to build system that works. And that's exactly what search engines are doing these days. Um, you know, machine learning has been introduced uh, heavily with uh, you know, the, the arrival of rank brain in Google. And, uh, and there is a lot of different mechanisms that uh, nowadays are at play when we run a query on a search engine like Google or Bing. Um, the reality is that this system desperately need data because you know the way that they work it's 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 by training models using structured data so when we talk about ai usually we talk about systems that have to replicate what the human brain does like you know very simple definition of ai is a system that replicates the functions of the human brain there are different functions and different cognitive capabilities that, uh, and, you know, that the brain achieves. So these are the five areas where we see you know, a lot of the research is, 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 is going. And, and these are really you know, the, the also five areas in which we have been studying the human brains for many, many years. So perception, you know, understanding a visual object, motion and manipulation, you know, understanding where the car should go, natural language, you know, understanding what, what is the content of an article, uh, memory and emotion, you know, deciding what is the mood that this user has when he's writing this comment, uh, reasoning and planning, you know, trying to understand if this statement is truth or not. That uh, that's requires reasoning. And, and you will see different technologies in the AI world. Right now we talk about artificial intelligence, but this is really an umbrella term for something way more diversified. It's a universe of different fields of applications. Now, our field of application is natural language processing, which is a specific area within you know, the linguistic AI, so-called. Um, Reasoning and planning, you find you know, the big platforms like Einstein or uh, IBM Watson, where you can actually have you know, different uh, areas combined and, and you can run queries on top of you know, data that you, you put. Um, you have, of course, um, things like Siri and the Google Assistant, and then, of course, uh, Affectiva that are starting to understand you know, the mood of the user by looking at the context. Where, where is the user? Is the user in the kitchen? So he's looking for a, you know, a very quick uh, response when he's asking for uh, how to make, uh, I don't know, pasta alla rabbiata. That's uh, all I can make. <laughs> uh, or is or in front uh, of, uh, of, um, of his laptop and is running a query asking to you know, places to go in, in Belgrade. So, and then, of course, the perception, uh, we, we start to see perception being applied also uh, directly on, on, on smartphone devices that now can unlock the screen by just looking at our face. So these are all different areas. And then, of course, motion and manipulation from a Tesla car that drives autonomously to, to an iRobot that can hoover your, your room. 
these are all different areas that fall into what we call AI, but really are extremely diversified areas of, of technology and, and development. So at the real basis of any AI system, there is data and there is a, a computing power which wasn't available many years ago. And then there is data science because this data is to be not only curated, but has also to be organized in such a way that we can create model to classify an image or to predict what you know, the numbers of visitors on my site are going to be, or if this is going to be the keyword that will grow in the next three months or not. So you need to have a lot of data. You need to have a lot of experience in curating this data, and then you need to have enough time to create your own models. In the linguistic AI and in many of the applications that we see today, including, of course, conversational uh, um, user interfaces, we will see these three technologies combined. Sometimes you see just one, sometimes you see a combination of one plus another one. Again, they are very different from each other. There are different algorithms, different branches, different areas of research. Uh, natural language understanding, it's something that we can use and it's a very challenging area, for instance, to create a summary. And a summary, you know, can be extractive, meaning that I can take the most relevant parts of a, a corp of text and then I can make a summary just by picking up the words that are more meaningful for representing the entire thing. And that's natural language understanding. It's the same technology that uh, it's used for understanding the query that we trigger on the search engine. Natural language processing, it's an another set of technologies that includes things like uh, part of speech tagging. So algorithms that help us create you know, segments out of a word and, and, and define, okay, this is, uh, this is a noun, or this is an objective that is related to the noun, and things like that. And then, for instance, uh, name entity recognition, detecting uh, a person, a brand, uh, a company out of a text, it's entity recognition. This is also, of course, part of what search engine do when we trigger a query and we say, okay, um, who is the CEO of Microsoft? You know, they have to understand Microsoft is an organization, CEO is, you know, a role in an organization, and then they can go and fetch the data. So that's natural language processing. Natural language generation is uh, probably one of the most advanced fields because it's when the computer has to generate, for instance, a new summary, not by reusing the word on the, you know, input text, but by creating a model that generates a completely new text. And there are very interesting experiments at the moment. It's very challenging, uh, very hard to find uh, an abstractive text summarization that works. Very complicated. Extractive summarization, yes, we can get r good results. Uh, abstractive text summarization, there are some recent papers from, from Google that uh, are, are presenting some, some very uh, interesting results, but is still a cutting edge area. Machine learning in a nutshell. So what do we do when, for instance, in our case, we wanted to create a tool that would automate SEO? So we started with a specific area, which is name entity recognition, and we had to create our own model. So what we did, we had data, and, and, and data that we used in our case for creating an NLP that worked across multiple languages was Wikipedia, because that's, uh, it's open, it's in multiple languages, and so we started to create a model by training uh, our NLP using an openly available uh, version of Wikipedia, which is called Airpedia. So when you create the model, then you can, you know, 
create uh, APIs that a developer can use for extracting whatever the model is capable of extracting. In our case, name entities. So things like CEO of Microsoft or you know, Tesla as a brand and so on and so forth. Well, wh when we move into, into the world of, uh, of SEO and, and search engine, um, well, this is one of the ways that AI is used by search engine to assess trustworthiness of a piece. We all have seen uh, you know, the effects of fake news and you know, whatever comes when uh, people start to manipulate information by you know, publishing statements that are not verified. So in order to verify statements, for instance, you know, Andrea is the CEO of Wordlift. That's a statement, right? So Andrea, CEO, Wordlift. So that's a statement. How do we verify it? In, in 2015, Google published a very interesting uh, research paper, which is uh, presenting uh, a concept of uh, creating this uh, knowledge-based trust, which is really a place where Google is storing all the statement. And so if we find a statement that says Andrea Volpini is the CEO of Wordlift on one website, and then he finds it on another website, then he starts believing that this is true. It must be true. I mean, it's on two websites. And of course, the more these websites are alternative, the more it works well. And that's, that's why, when, uh, when we want to create something that gets into the knowledge graph and therefore enters into the voice search, we want to create something in a consistent way across multiple sites. And, and we want to make it easy on the crawler to find all the different co-occurrences of the statement, right? So um, we do this by interlinking, by creating links on the metadata with other giant graph like DBpedia or Wikidata or the Google Knowledge Graph itself. So we want to help the search engine understand that what we say is true. In a way, you know, it's like doing backlinks in the old days, but with data. Go for it. Said again? So for something like this, are you talking about how uh, Google is using machine yep. learning to that project? Yep. So if you use something like a blockchain instead where you don't necessarily need to have trust in the equation, that would be another alternative? That's, that's really a new frontier that uh, it's still uh, on the way. But uh, a lot of this knowledge, much like uh, the, the crawling index, a lot of this knowledge is duplicated. And if we would have a blockchain for, for these statements, that would be you know, a complete revolution, absolutely. Go for it. Well, I mean, the, the way that they use it, I mean, the, the way if you, if you go through this paper, um, you will see that uh, they do a mathematical equation, which is not so far from, you know, looking at the ledger and say, yes, this is, uh, you know, has been shared already by so many systems. So uh, in the linked data world, there is a lot of uh, now tension in going towards blockchain because, of course, uh, it would simplify a lot the infrastructure if we could share you know, the information that otherwise is accessible in these different knowledge bases. Yes, at the moment, they are very separated, but uh, in, the, in the research field, there is a, a tendency now to look at blockchain as a solution for uh, you know, duplicating statement and also like sharing this knowledge across multiple systems. Yep. So Andres, uh, is this been around for like a decade or is it evolving and improving? For example, uh, I don't know, can this model be manipulated and played by someone? Uh, like 
this this model this model yes i mean uh, you could see that i could teach my my mom and dad and if if i would have put a fa false statement <laughs> it would be there <laughs> so yes i mean of course uh, like any system there is a flaw <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, it's, it's, it's way more complicated as, as we get more data. As the data gets more structure, of course, uh, you know, creating a, a fake news, it gets more complicated. But as you can see, <laughs> it's still fairly easy. <laughs> you know, we can still uh, give the election to Trump or things like that. So it's still very easy to <laughs> manipulate systems. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, one way is for sure would be like blockchains, because of course uh, you have to have um, a provenance, we say. I mean, who is saying that? That's the main issue. I mean, a provenance statement is, is always missing, or most of the time is missing, especially if you go into these messy data sets like Wikidata. Who has said that uh, my mom is called uh, Anna? I don't know. <laughs> There's no provenance. So provenance is, is one of the things that... Uh, that uh, for instance, a signature from a blockchain could somehow help. So there is a lot of work, but yeah, we're still far. We can still say a lot of uh, fake news. <laughs> Technical SEO, big terms if you are in SEO world. Um, that's a little bit of a stretch, but, uh, but uh, we, we, we see more and more Google going towards structured data, linked data, um, as I said, when I started uh, uh, and I was uh, telling clients, uh, I want to experiment with semantic web technology and your ranking will go up in 2008. People were looking at me like I was crazy. Some people giving even me money, but it was very hard to <laughs> prove the return of the investment. These days, with initiatives like uh, accelerated mobile pages and structured data, and uh, you know all the different variations that we see in the search engine results pages. Uh, there are, I think, now up to 37 different ways on a SERP to display a result. You know, from the flights uh, information to a recipe, from you know a, a knowledge panel to to a map. There are so many variation of results in the SERP that. Um, everyone now starts to understand how much the data behind it's helpful. And, um, and so linked data is really one of the key elements of the new technical SEO. And, and, and we can prove it by the numbers. And uh, Google has recently presented three use cases on their website that show that uh, a website like Eventbrite by adding structured data on their event pages has grown by 100% the organic traffic on these pages. And Google himself is presenting this data. So I don't need to even you know, do my homework in, 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 in proving that this technology is working because Google is doing it. And the reason Google does it is that AI needs it. And that's, that's where, where we come in. So we're gonna kind of uh, now get more into um, some practical aspects of structured data markup, AMP. How many of you are familiar with AMP? Wow, everyone is familiar, that's good. <laughs> uh, how many of you are against AMP? Few, okay, good. <laughs> why, why you're against? Yep. And uh, you actually don't, cannot use any JavaScript, you have trouble yep. with uh, uh, Google Tag Manager, yep. JavaScript, whatever. It is, it is still a very complicated issue. Um, I do agree with you. I always say to client, let's think through it <laughs> before we do it. Um, it is also true that in some countries, like in Italy, for instance, it does bring you know, a lift in traffic. You move to the US, it doesn't even work in that way. <laughs> so based on the country you live in, I've seen AMP reacting in different ways. And it is still an investment that in some cases justified, in some cases not. I do recommend it because of course, if you want to get into you know, this new world of voice search and you know, 
actions and you know um, conversational uh, searches, then yes, I strongly recommend it because I can see the impact uh, of using AMP. But yes, it's uh, still complicated. Google Action is uh, anyone familiar with it? No? Okay, you will be at the end of the workshop familiar with the Google Actions. So you come back home and you will say, I want to do my Google Action too. That's, that's my goal for today. <laughs> All right, so um, first message, focus on the data, not on the eye. That's um, one of the three messages that I'm going to leave you today. Is that um, a lot of the talk about AI, AI powered uh, content marketing, and, and then people start to think about the technology, which is, yes, it's interesting, it's important. You have to familiarize with the different frameworks, TensorFlow, and you know, the different areas and fields that we've seen before. But really, as, a, as an editor, as a publisher, um, as an SEO specialist, as an agency, you should really focus on the data before even thinking about you know, what different AI system and, 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 and what's on. Everything's clear so far? We're good? Okay. All right, so um, linguistic semantics. This is my to-do list for uh, uh, creating content that works with voice search. That's really, you know, if I have to give you one slide that you bring home and then you start experimenting with, that's something that I would recommend to, to, to bring with you. Feature snippets are still strongly driving voice searches. Um, there is still a lot of experiments on feature snippet from Google itself. So the results are very volatile. They come and go, you get it, then you lose them. <laughs> but um, like a lot of the SEO um, world knows, uh, this thing get more and more consistent, but um, optimizing for feature snippets, it has to do with looking at uh, long tail keywords. What is a long tail keyword? Someone with a definition. Go for it. Good. Query more descriptive is what I like the most because the other part, yes, it might be competitive, might not be competitive, it depends. But uh, yes, uh, more than three, four words uh, and, and it's descriptive. Anything else for uh, describing a long tail? You want to say something? That's, that's very interesting. That's very SEO <laughs> focused. But uh, yes, the, the traffic that you get might not be the combination of the keywords. It's a completely different track and the volume is big, you know, if you, if you tap into something like that. How do you search for these keywords? How would you do keyword research for a long tail? Uh, yes and no. Not really good thought. Any, any other idea? Go. It's good. I'm not a big fan of that. It's good because it, it, it helps you understand the questions around the topic. But you're going to really use it and then find something that, that, that creates traffic? No, I never... I mean, yeah, good suggestions, but... Uh, that's good. Yeah, that's better. That's very more practical. I mean, it always works, but the Google suggests, the Google suggests it does bring, you know, a long tail. Um, you can actually look from the search console uh, in the mobile search queries and you can start comparing the mobile search queries on your site with the desktop search and then you might find something that it's long tail. Um, you might also look at uh, the different commands of the Google Assistant to find inspiration because the Google Assistant now is covering a lot of different intents they are the third-party application, like the Google Action that we will see. 
but uh, the Google Assistant itself, it's covering a lot of different intent. So an intent from the Google Assistant might be a base for your long tail keyword, right? So Google Search Console, uh, Google Assistant commands, um, Google Suggest. Yes, these are ways of, of, of looking at these long tail keywords. And the analytics, of course. Of course, absolutely. That's, that's always helpful. At the moment, we don't have really a way in the analytics to look at what's coming from voice. right? That's a little bit of a limitation. They say that something will come, but it's not yet there. Um, what I also use from the Google Search Console, I filter the results with uh, rich result for AMP. I don't know if you remember in the Google Search Console, there is a filter on the queries that uh, you can uh, use for getting all rich results from AMP or no AMP. But these rich results are Sometimes interesting to, to, to find your long tail keywords. Second point, add structured data and, and, and do it using linked data. And now we will see what this means and exactly how this can be done. Write articles, that's, uh, that's basis, but uh, sometimes we forget that when we start talking with Alexa, a lot of the, the usage that we make of, of, of these uh, personal assistant it's really at the beginning, at the top of the funnel. You can also make a purchase now with, this, with Alexa or with the Google Assistant, but rarely people do. You know, the volumes of, of the, of the um, logs, the search that people make through a personal digital assistant such as Alexa or Cortana are at the beginning of the story, at the top of the funnel. So I am starting to maybe ask, uh, you know, uh, what are the restaurants in, in Belgrade? Or uh, where can I eat uh, um, sushi in Belgrade? Which is already, you know, very close to the, to the, to the final uh, uh, booking intent. But, uh, but a lot of the chatbot or personal digital assistant interaction are at the beginning of the funnel. Which means that you still have to create great content to bring the user to the next phase. Because if you limit yourself to just create, a, for instance, an answer for your chatbot, but then the users cannot discover anything more, then the conversation is kind of left in a point where it doesn't really bring the conversion. I will give you some examples later on that maybe will make it uh, clearer. But write articles, not just simple answers for the long tail uh, search query that uh, you have found. Um, Look at elocution. That's uh, one of the um, guidelines from Google when creating uh, voice rating content or machine rating content. Elocution means that when you read it aloud, it sound nice, you know? And, uh, and sometimes when we write, we don't read. <laughs> what we write aloud. We read it, but not aloud. When you start reading, you know, something aloud, then you realize that oh, maybe it's too long or oh, maybe it's too boring or I didn't need this phrase. You know, we, we become more and more conversational when things are spoken aloud rather than when we read. I will give you plenty of examples where I made the mistake of, you know, bad elocution. So <laughs> you will see what I mean. Uh, embrace AMP, that's my suggestion. I do agree with people that have still concern. It is a cost to embrace a AMP but uh, it does bring a value on the user experience. Uh, there is an interesting, uh, I think, uh, boot these days. It's the first time at the WordCamp that I see Google. And uh, so that's a strong sign <laughs> for the community. I don't know if it's good or bad, but, uh, but go to the boot <laughs> and, uh, and try to learn more a little bit about how to overcome the JavaScript issues because, of course, they are doing a tremendous work in creating you know, this new plugin that it will allow us to create native AMP experiences sometimes in the future. What is semantics? Semantics is about the meaning of words. So if I say, I love Belgrade, or if I do it this way, I am changing the structure, I'm changing the syntax, I'm changing the symbol, 
but the meaning stays the same. So semantics is about conveying a meaning into the words. Now, the way that the human language works is that uh, the symbolic information is stored into, into symbols. It can be an art, it can be a word. So, and, and then we share these symbols in our minds. And, uh, and then we have grammatical rules that help us you know, understand each other. And, and that's a little bit about how human language works. But how does a computer share meaning? How can I you know, mimic this process and uh, bring information in a meaningful way to a machine? And that's where the semantic web comes in. So I have some information about Gennaro, who is here with me. Uh, um, at the conference, and, and, and Gennaro has its own uh, uh, properties, its name, its you know, surname, gender, and fiancé, and so on, which is on, on the website A. And then there is a property that connects Gennaro with, uh, with uh, Andrea, or Andy, that is knows. So there is a property that connects one entity with another entity, and the information about each entity is on a different website or can be on a different website, can also be on the same website. But, you know, a machine will, will, will look at the data on a first website and then will have a link to another website to get more information about another entity, in this case, another person. And then maybe, you know, Andrea has been, uh, was born in Rome in Italy, and then there is maybe another website that a machine can consult to understand, you know, something about the place where Andrea was born. So each piece of information is linked with properties. And computers use unique identifiers. These are URL. More precisely, these are URI, so uniform resource identifiers. And this is mine, so that's, that's my entity. That's the entity that represents myself. And, uh, and it's a linked data persistent URI, meaning that when a, when a crawler or a machine gets there, um, he only gets an RDF representation of the information that describes me or a JSON-LD that represents the information that describes me. If you go with the browser, it will show you a page. Quite boring, but <laughs> it's just a page with data inside. But the most important thing is that I have you know, my unique URI that describes me, and a machine can always go here and find more data about myself and links to other data. I also have a, another unique URI on Wikidata. Everyone knows Wikidata? Everyone does? Good. Okay. So Wikidata is another unique URI that talks about myself. And that's a little bit of an overview of Wikidata for the entity that represent myself. And, um, and from this um, graph, we can see that the same person on Wikidata that has that URI is also described on another page, on another URI, which is the one that I showed you before. And then there are other information. I'm a human, yes, hopefully. And, uh, and so in Wikidata, using an exact match property, I am saying this entity is equivalent to the entity that is over there. So a machine, when it gets into a graph like Wikidata or my own website and find these URIs, can get a lot more information about myself. And even if the page is only talking about myself speaking at the WordCamp today with you, it's also bringing you know, this cloud of information about me being the CEO of a company called WordLift and, and created in Italy. So um, all this information is made available to the machines so that they can process it, and then you can go and ask, you know, who is Andrea Volpini? and then they will know because they have enough data 
that they have acquired from my own websites, from the link data that I published from my own website and from publicly available resources like Wikidata. So structured data, as we see, is really linked data. And, and the foundation of structured data is this area of the semantic web, which is called linked data. Now let's ask Google. OK, Google, what is schema.org? So this was coming from, from my website in the beginning because uh, I was able to create a feature snippet that was about schema and I tag you know, the page with schema. But you might have noticed that the evolution is not really the best because it's kind of long, you know. Um, lingua franca, yeah, it's good, but it sounds a little bit weird. <laughs> uh, so it's no longer there, but, uh, but it was there. Um, Schema.org, I think everyone is familiar in the room, right? It's a linked data vocabulary. And the linked data vocabulary can be combined with other vocabularies. Because if I need to describe, uh, for instance, uh, I don't know, a medicine, you know, schema might not be the best. Because, of course, a medicine has a lot of properties that are very specific to the knowledge domain of health. And so I can use schema as a, you know, kind of a early or basic representation of my content. But then I could also, with linked data, attach way more properties than what schema allows me to do. And um, apparently search engines are also happy when we do that, when we create more resources about the things that we talk, because then they can use it for disambiguating queries and providing answers. So it's a community-driven effort. Everyone can jump in um, on the GitHub where you know, the vocabulary is managed. There is a lot of uh, uh, work behind extensions. So I've been um, somehow involved in creating or contributing to the extension for the travel industry, which is a work done by the Semantic Technology Institute of Innsbruck. So I collaborate with them in the past, and that kind of created a new area of schema for the travel industry. Then, of course, you have you know, all the e-commerce initiatives, and there is a lot of activities behind schema. So I really recommend you to following you know, the language and also looking at other linked data vocabularies that are interoperable with schema that you can use for creating better metadata. Anyone familiar with the five-star linked data? No? That's uh, sound. OK, go. <laughs> go for it. Uh, no, no, not <laughs> no. That's a little bit more uh, on the linked data. So you know this guy, Tim Berners-Lee, invented the web. He also invented the semantic web. And he designed a five-star methods for classifying data. OK, so when you create a, a PDF, for instance, and you put it online and there is no license and there is a license attached that say that everyone can use the PDF, then you get one star because it's, it's open data. Right. But uh, but the format is closed. It's a PDF. So you have to have something from Adobe to read it. But it's open data. So first star. Second star, the data starts to be structured. In a PDF, we have a text, which is unstructured, so a machine doesn't really understand what's inside a PDF. That's what we call unstructured data, and it's in a proprietary format, so one star. Two stars. The data is structured. There is a spreadsheet, and there is a license that says to machine, yes, come and read, right? Two stars because the format of an Excel is proprietary. You need to have a Microsoft product to open an Excel file. Three star, the format is open. So you have a structured data license in a CSV format. 
way better for a machine. You know, a lot of the, the knowledge that Google uh, has created around uh, its knowledge panel is derived from the open data that was available in Wikipedia, but also in the Google tables, which is kind of a forgotten project that Google initiated for starting to get, you know, structured data. So a CSV is good because it's, uh, it's open and it's structured and it's licensed. But it's not descriptive because if, uh, if I have a column that describe, you know, for instance, uh, the number of seats in a car, a computer might not understand what number of seats means, you know, for a car. A human can make the jump you know, and, and, and bridge the semantic gap and understand, yeah, okay, so this got to be the number of seats inside the car, but maybe a computer cannot make the jump that easily. So in RDF, which is an XML uh, format that was created by the W3C, every piece of information in this table is described using a vocabulary, such as schema. So a property like uh, the seats in a car have a specific attributes that is described in a linked data vocabulary like schema.org. So a computer can understand specifically what this number is because it's described. Five stars is when the data gets linked with other data. So in the example of my URI, um, that data was linked with the data on, on Wikidata. That's very powerful for a computer because he can jump on my page and then he finds a reference to the equivalent entity on Wikidata and then he gets more information and then he understands, ah, that's the guy. Okay, I know a lot about him. So when the data gets linked, then we have the five stars linked data. Now, the reason I'm talking about it in a, in a, in a WordPress conference is that this does have an SEO impact because the more you make it easy for the crawler to index your content by creating you know, entry points and by describing the data, the more it's easy for them to feel confident when delivering you know, the result. So linked data, I mean, this, this thing of open data has been for many years just uh, you know, discussion inside the academic world first and then the public administration because of the open data movement. But right now, it's becoming relevant also for the SEO industry. And that's, that's what we do, basically. OK, Google, what is personal assistant search optimization? I'm not on board with. The acronym PASA stands for personal assistant search optimization. And it is referred to the use of SEO techniques with the aim of positioning content as the source of the answers given by personal assistants, such as Siri and Google Assistant, to their users. So that's according to WordLift, but it's actually a definition that came from another um, expert in the industry. And it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, the area of, of SEO where SEO meets like voice search and chatbots. And it's called personal assistant search optimization. And, you know, it's basically what we are talking about right now. We've done with the first block. We're moving into the second block. Take a breath. <laughs> You're still all with me, most of it. <laughs> um, now we will uh, dive into the lesson learned in, in creating conversational experiences and the mistakes that you can make. Did anyone in the room create a radio chatbot? All right, what is the chatbot doing? Okay. Such as, what is the type of question that you can answer? Okay. Okay. Cool. And and where was uh, the chatbot developed? Okay. Okay. Telegram, okay, okay. What about, what was the other chatbot? I saw another chatbot, okay. <laughs> I, uh, it was like a it was like guided to Joan Adventure Yoga. So I was playing around with Alexa, but instead of having it respond with text to speech, I recorded it and it myself, so I had it walk myself through. Wow, that's, that's very advanced. <laughs> I feel like crashes and it really worked out. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, there's no relaxation. Yep. That's good. So is, is it live, the skill, or? Uh, no. No? <laughs> what was the other chatbot? Go for it. Uh, we developed a chatbot for qualifying. I don't know if we have a microphone. Maybe it's easier for everyone in the room. I can bring it myself. I can do some exercise. You can do that. All right. I always need exercise, but <laughs> next time that's okay. <laughs> Beer hopping. Uh, as soon as I'm done, you know, I will start uh, going out looking for beer. So that's gonna be my exercise for the All evening. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see me around. <laughs> we developed. Uh, here. Yep. We developed a chatbot for qualifying leads for the automotive industry. Oh wow! So basically, ask the user if is interested in a car yeah if has already a car what so did you use for creating the chatbot uh, for the first draft uh, they were the messenger API. A and then you, you just created uh, the logic uh, yourself uh, yes okay but we are developing a new chatbot based on node.js okay okay like cool cool all right um, there was another chatbot over here yes <laughs> Um, we built quite a simple sort of decision tree Facebook chatbot okay. um, that led users through a kind of recommendation engine for Lego products, which was quite cool. Okay. It, it was like very basic. There's no natural language yep. processing. Right apply there, to apply products. to what area? Um, E-commerce. So e at the end of it, they could click through to a product okay. and buy it. Yeah. Was it good? I mean, feedback out of these uh, experiments uh, in terms of usage. <laughs> it's it's still hard. Uh, some, somehow it's hard, but it depends on the on the intent. Depends on the intent. I mean, if you want to relax, no, <laughs> switch it off. <laughs> okay. We've integrated it with Slack. Okay. We have a chat about the deployer that wow. helps us basically uh, get code reviews each time we deploy. Oh wow, that's 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 good. All right. Um, so let's see uh, some of the mistakes that you can make. But before, I'm gonna kind of introduce you into again an SEO tactics that that um, we're gonna see into details. So I'm gonna ask now, okay, Google, tell me something about Andre Volpini. Sure, for that, you might like Sir Jason Link. Wanna give it a try? Yes. Andrea Volpini, CEO of Workday, is a visionary entrepreneur, now focusing on semantic web and artificial intelligence, co-founder of Inside Out 10 and director of Inside Out Today, an Egyptian award-winning creative digital agency focusing on the African continent. Andrea has 20 years of world-class experience in online strategies and web publishing. Would you like to hear another fact? Please, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye-bye. <laughs> so, you, we have to work a little bit on the content, but definitely, you know, you, you see that it's very long, it's, you know, come on, stop it. Why the voice change? Yes, okay, why the voice change? Because if you heard, uh, I asked the assistant of Google to tell me something about Andrea Volpini, and I specifically pronounce my name not in Italian, but as an English person would, so Andrea Volpini. <laughs> but, uh, but the interesting part is that the Google Assistant is, is responding by asking the user for that, would you like me to ask Sir Jason Link? Now, Sir Jason Link is the Google action that I have created for intercepting specific content from the Google Assistant users without them knowing me. So the reason the voice changed is that that search JSON link is not the Google Assistant. It's an application within the Google Assistant. 
And this mechanism that in Alexa is still, uh, um, I would say, not as developed as in the Google um, Assistant environment, it's called uh, implicit discovery. That means that Google is searching for the intents that your AI is covering and is proposing your agent, your chatbot, your assistant to users that don't know you. And so in a way, in an AI first world, that's the new SEO. Because I am using my voice to speak with Google Home or a Google Android device mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I am asking a long tail query such as tell me something about, very generic. I mean, <laughs> it's not going to convert. I'm not going to sell subscription with this, but it was interesting experiment. And, and, and Google, much like it does on a SERP, is recommending my AI to answer to this question to whatever users. And I was able to make 670 conversation in a day just using Google. No one knew my assistant app. I mean, it was just a test. But an interesting amount of traffic arrived on the AI that I, I have created because Google was recommending it for specific intents. So then I started to think, how can I bring traffic back to my site? You know, <laughs> I have 670 users there, how we drive it? And then, and then you will see, you know, I found a way and I was able in this experiment to resuscitate pages on my site that had zero traffic and bring, you know, some level of traffic, which was for me very impressive as a result. So when you start creating a chatbot or, or a conversational experience, we heard, you know, I, we didn't use NLP or yes, we have a decision tree. Really, when I started to do this, uh, this work, which is really started as an experiment, I was challenged by a guy called Scott Abel, who runs a uh, um, an agency called the Content Wrangler in the Silicon Valley, and he say, Andy, you have developed an amazing tool, but show me what you can do. <laughs> so I say, come on. I mean, the, look at the tool, but, but then, um, then he challenged me, and, uh, and then he said, okay, what can you do with the semantic technology that you have to, to engage the users, to engage the reader more. And so I started creating you know, this experiment just to <laughs> respond to a challenge that I received to a guy from a guy in the States. And so I really uh, wanted to make my website talk somehow. And then I start you know, thinking about uh, examples of in the past. And then Pygmalion is, is one example. We also have in Italy Pinocchio, <laughs> which uh, probably some of you read it, you read it. Right? So, I mean, you have this inanimated thing like a website, like your website, and you want to make it talk, and you really have to put all the love and, and the good spirit and, you know, and the intention that you have to, to, to make it talk, because, uh, because it's really an arduous process. So that's, that's one thing. You have to decide that you really want to make uh, something inanimated like a website talk. Uh, but then, of course, uh, there is a... Uh, you do need knowledge, you do need a graph. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Konigsberg bridge problem. No, Konigsberg doesn't, yeah, that's, what is it? <laughs> yeah. Finding the, the shortest path to cross the seven bridges of the city of Konigsberg without going to the same bridge twice. That was the major goal. And uh, we are in uh, now Russia, now, now Germany, but uh, we were back in uh, 1735 in Prussia. And, uh, and, uh, and um, a Swiss mathematician called Euler decided that uh, he wanted to help the mayor of the city of Konigsberg answer to the question. And, and so he created a mathematical theory that now we call graph theory to demonstrate that it was not possible. Oh, wow. <laughs> And so uh, you need to organize content in a graph in order for making you know, information accessible and, and, and conversation can move forward when you have more information, more data. 
And then Eliza uh, Weisenbaum uh, is the first chatbot ever. So if you are starting to develop a chatbot, start playing with Eliza first, because a lot of the dynamics in the conversation that are used in today's chatbot frameworks are still based on you know, what uh, Weisenbaum created with Eliza. And the problem of Eliza is that he didn't have the knowledge, he didn't have the graph, so he had to use the input of the user and, and repurpose it. These are a little bit of the, like, the three steps on, on creation of, of a conversational experience. You start with an inspiration, then you look at the intents that you want to focus on, much like we described on the long tail keywords, you want to look at the intent. So what is the intent that your application is going to cover? That's very important. And then you can cover to one, two, three intents, but you cannot be too broad because otherwise it's not going to work. And then you have the design, the validation, and the creation. In, our, um, in my examples, I use Dialogflow, which is a, a bot framework uh, that was acquired now by Google. So it works very well with the Google Assistant and it allows you to create Google Actions quite easily. And I use WordPress as a backend. And then I use, of course, WordLift. And, uh, and, uh, and I started to look at intents that I wanted to cover with my, my chatbot. And I thought, when people are in front of, of a website, what do they ask? You know, what is this website about? And you know, mm, what are the main topics? Who is the publisher? So I, I started to think about what question people wanted to ask to a website. And so that's basically uh, Sir Jason Link in a simulator that allows you to talk to my website. And I think you should talk. So um, you can uh, tap into Sir Jason Link using uh, now um, a window on our website, Google Home devices, and uh, direct links that we are creating from our website to, to, to Sir Jason Links. This is a little bit of the, the new Google Analytics, so the data that you get out of a conversation that allows you to see the number of sessions, the number of queries per day, how long you know, the application is, it, is taken to respond. If you want to take the analytics forward, then I, I do recommend you, if you are creating you know, your own action or your own chatbot, I do recommend you to look at uh, chat base or bot analytics as you know, frameworks that allows you to measure more properly how the conversation moves forward uh, because there is a lot of lear learning that you can make from this data. So this is a little bit of the session flow from Sir Jason Link. You can see that you know a lot of the people focus their attention on, on the topic, which is like what is structured data? You can ask Sir Jason Link or what is semantic SEO? So a lot of the flow goes there. And then you can see and, and debug and see you know people are, are dropping here because you know next events it depends on the events that we mention on the site. So you can uh, analyze the pathways of the user using a session flow, which is available in you know, the, the various tools that you use for uh, either creating the chatbot, in this case, this is from Dialogflow, or you know, analytics for conversation experience. And these are the areas where you want to measure the, the, the way that you know, the chatbot is responding. It's like a framework for, you know, is, is context being taken into account? Does the chatbot understand that I'm, I'm in Belgrade? Or does the chatbot remember that I already present myself? Because you, know, you don't want to hear again, for instance, the introduction. You know, is, is the response relevant? Is error managed properly? So these are different areas that you can use for analyzing the performance of your chatbot. And think about chatbot as websites. And think about WordPress as your knowledge base that you want to use for creating something like, like JSON Link. 
Keep the dialogue short and simple, rule number one. I never do that. I always have these long phrases. And, uh, and then I started to add uh, a new functionality that cuts the phrase after the first uh, sentence or after the second sentence. And then I added another intent, which is, would you like to know something more? That's good, because maybe the user does want to know something more, maybe doesn't. Be brief, personalize to the user. Uh, if the user has logged in, you know a lot of information, either on Alexa or on the Google Assistant. Test it with real users before going out to the crowd. I didn't do that. I went out in the wild. I, I probably disappointed seven, hundreds and hundreds of people in the first days <laughs> until I saw the logs and I said, oh, I'm not intercepting this intent. Let's remove it. <laughs> um, it's like a far west nowadays. It's like the web in the 1990s. So there is uh, <laughs> not many people around. You can still make interesting things. And then, then, of course, focus on making your chatbot discoverable. You can advertise your chatbot on Bing with paid advertising. Uh, you can use the Google uh, Action directory for presenting your chatbot. But again, focus on the quality of the user interaction, not on the eye. That's uh, the other message for you. So. Just a wrap up, we've seen the, this is again an, an example of asking the Google Assistant something about my company and, and my action is popping up. That's very good for me because then I can control the user experience. So if someone is interested about WordLift, then search JSON link is called and then I can manage it and maybe I can explain what the plugin does and you know, how you can optimize the SEO and so on and so forth. So remember, this is a, a discovery technique that it's very powerful and, and it's going to be like the new SEO. What you can do, structured data AMP, you will get the feature snippets, you will get you know, the first voice search responses. Second step, claim the directory page on the Google Assistant directory. It's very important. Some of you might have received a message from the Google Search Console that tells you to claim your, your action on, on, on the Google Assistant directory. This only happens if you are tagging news, podcast, or recipe. So if you're using structured data for news article, recipe, or podcast, you might have the chance to claim your directory page and Google will do the rest without the need of even creating the action. Third, best option, make the mistake I made, possibly less, and create your own custom action for the Google Assistant. So that's a structured data and AMP example. I asked to the Google Assistant what is semantic SEO and is responding with a feature snippet that comes from my website. You just have to have structured data and use AMP. That also help. Second, claim the directory page. This is a directory page I created for a client that is using news article. And so Google is creating you know, a nice presence in the Google Action Directory for them. And then, of course, third, third step, use link data, use natural language processing, and then create your own custom action. I think we might have some minutes for a demo or not. No, five minutes? How many minutes? Yes. <laughs> All right. I mean, so. So this is uh, basically how Dialogflow looks. You have the different intents, which, is, which are the, the questions that the people can, can make. And now this is the logic that creates the conversation. And this is the publishing platform. This is the Google Action publishing platform. So this is uh, my buddy, Sir Jason Lynx, is with me. You don't see him. That's the 200, 2,000 monthly conversation. I mean. Just to give you numbers, our website is still uh, you know, fairly new and, and we reach probably around uh, 6,000, 8,000 users with the website. So I'm, you know, 2,000 conversation for me, it's a huge number. Um, let's go into simulator. That's an area where, where you can actually um, test how things are working. All right, getting the test version of Sir Jason Link. Greetings, I'm Wordex Companion and my name is Jason Link. 
You can ask me facts about the upcoming events, information about my publisher, or I can help you know better what the main topics of the wordlift.io website. So now let's jump a little bit on, on the website. Um, this is our own website in production. <laughs> I hope I don't make any mess. <clears throat> First thing I have to remember the how to get in. Ah, it's just a caption. Uh, that's easy. Ah, yeah, that's all. That's right. That's right. I can do that. I guess I don't see it. I should remember it. So, um, so this is uh, an article about the WordCamp, and and you see WordLift is running here. So the NLP is extracting the concept uh, about this article, and I'm I'm talking about here about different topics. One of the topic is is Gutenberg that probably is one of the things that we want to hear about uh, in this, uh, in this uh, work camp. So as an editor, I'm just uh, you know, highlighting Gutenberg as a topic that represents this article. WordLift is creating a, an entity for Gutenberg that describes a little bit what Gutenberg is. And, uh, and it's creating this entity using data that I have on my site or that is coming from Wikipedia, right? So it's creating a new entity page. Now this new entity page has uh, its own unique URI in the linked data world. So it's published on data.wordlift.io. Uh, and uh, while it loads, it's also made accessible through the chatbot. So I can go here and ask, uh, Like to know. So he's pulling the data from the entity that uh, WordLift has created about Gutenberg. And it's also provided me a link back to the page. So this is a way that I was able to generate traffic back to the site because some devices have a screen that I can use for creating reach cards that have a link back to my site. And, uh, and you're going to see this traffic as coming from Google as a referral, because it's really coming from, from the Google Assistant platform. Um, and we have a 500 error here, which is not good. But um, So this is a, a little bit of you know, a way in which we can you know, move from the website content into the chatbot. So I can make more complicated queries on the structured data that I have behind the entity, such as, you know, when is the work camp Europe taking place? This is one of the action that uh, Sir Jason Link supports. It will go back and it will make the query on the link data that WordLift creates, specifically on the JSON LD of this, of this page. And then it will give, you know, the answer back to Dialogflow, then we'll send it back to the, to the, to the chatbot. And then I can create more complicated conversational experiences by using uh, queries on the knowledge base that I have created. So if I ask, what are the next events? That requires a level of computation. So I'm going to run a query on the linked data and get the results. And then Sir Jason Link from the website is going to create cards about the upcoming events that we're going to attend. So. So. Long story short, focus on great content, not on the eye. So create pages that people want to read. Yep. Okay. We're done. So I mean, <laughs> but if there are questions, I'm happy to take them, of course. Well, the data, the data that, uh, that Sir Jason Link uses is yours because it's created from your website. Uh, uh, you can create uh, Google Action not necessarily with Dialogflow. You can um, even write the code yourself uh, and just uh, tap into the Google Action. Dialogflow is really a framework that allows you to 
you know, train the system and, you know, design the intent in a more easy way, let's say. But any other questions? Uh, about your t-shirt, Dancing with my SEO. Yes. Yep. I see you balancing that. Like you're using multiple names. Yep. And thinking about the context you're working in. I'm just curious about your thoughts about like the Google system, like giving all the data to Google versus like open systems like MyProp yep. versus yep. Or, or trying to do closed versions of robots. I think that uh, it all boils to one specific point that is uh, data rights. Right now, Google is angry for data and is not paying for data, right? So we are willing to give data for free because we want to earn visibility onto its platforms. But we are getting to the point where I'm going to put a license on my triples. And so if you're coming and you're consulting Google about my data, then Google will be able to pay me back. And that's, again, kind of a blockchain a logic. Because uh, if, if we give all the data for free, then uh, I don't know if we end up in a better society or worse. Probably, I think we're going to end up in a favelas. So I believe that everyone should retain the value of his own data. Right now, I believe that open data is the framework because it doesn't mean that it has to be free. Open data means that you can license it. And if Google can use it, in my case, it can use it. I'm fine. But I have to, you know, I have control on my data. I can decide any time that I put a license, sorry, you're using it, I sue you. So yes, data, data ownership, it's important. Good point. Yep. Are you using the Alexa or Google Assistant? I'm using Google Assistant, but I have also prepared a slide for you because I also use Alexa. So these are two um, technologies and plugins for people that wants to work on Alexa that uh, I would recommend you to use, um, that I used. And uh, yes, this is uh, my Alexa experiment. Ask Wordlift. So, skill is called Wordlift. Like, what are the latest articles? Now, what can I help you with? So. Ask Wordlift to read the latest article. First, the upcoming webinar on machine-friendly content hosted by Scott Abel. Second, The Outsider, integrating non-family executives in the family business. Read the first one. The webinar will be on September 14th, hosted by Scott Abel and with Andrea Volkini as a guest. You will learn why making your website machine-friendly is key to grow your organic traffic and how to prepare content that works well with personal assistance voice search. So I'm a little bit behind in Alexa uh, because I, I focus more on the Google Assistant and the Google Action Environment. The reality is that they are very similar. And again, if you have data structured, you can create you know, your own experience on multiple uh, services. Uh, things like Dialogflow allows you to export a skill into Alexa. So connect the website to a chatbot framework, and then from there you can, uh, you know, integrate with Alexa, Google Action, and the different uh, Skype, for instance. And is it possible uh, to call Google uh, on a uh, salesman that's screen turn off? That depends on the device, yes. It depends on. Yeah, it is. Um, the n I think uh, this is the Pixel 2. I think uh, if you let it do it, it will do it. Yes. Yeah. I couldn't make it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you're using. <laughs> yep. <coughs> Well, uh, <clears throat> an entity is a specific thing. So it's something that exi exists uh, in the knowledge graph. So something like uh, a Chinese cuisine is an entity. Something like a cheap laptop, no, because cheap is an adjective of a thing. So an entity would be laptop. Uh, I can create a, an article that has the entity laptop and then reference to the concept of, you know, 
being cheap. But uh, cheap laptop is not an entity, so I would not use uh, that. But um, Chinese cuisine, rock and roll, go for it, <laughs> it's good. So everything where you see a knowledge graph panel or you have an article on Wikipedia, you can think of it as an entity, really. So that's a little bit of a summary, question we've done. That's another one that you can use on Google Action. Um, Doctor Search Marketing, I created, this is a, like a trivia quiz for SEO experts. Uh, go for it. If you take uh, four out of five, I give you a t-shirt tomorrow. <laughs> All right, thank you.